get started. So uh, this is going to be about build your own EST in PowerShell. Uh, if you don't know what an EST is, hopefully you'll find out. Uh, if you don't, it's, it's probably my fault. So uh, I'm Chris Gardner. I've been using PowerShell for six-ish years, I think. Um, I have way too many side projects. This was one of them. Um, I do a lot of work with Azure, with DSC, a bunch of other stuff. I've got stickers. If anyone wants stickers, I have lots of them. Please take some stickers off me. I spent too much money on them. Uh, if you're on Slack or Discord yet, feel free to join. There's a bunch of really great community on there. It's all bridged together. If you live in the 90s, we also have IRC, um, which is bridged in one of the channels, but no one really wants to use IRC other than Adam's not in the room, so it's fine. Um, so we're going to talk about what is an abstract syntax tree, or AST. Uh, I'm just going to keep saying AST because it's a lot easier for me. Um, we'll have a, look, a quick look at the PowerShell AST, uh, so we get familiar with what ASTs look like and with one particular that people are aware of. Um, we're going to look at how we make our own AST, that's kind of the point, what we do with it, and how we use it, and then what do we do next after that. And I've got some lessons learned and stuff in there as well. So what is an, AS, an abstract, abstract syntax tree? So Wikipedia has this lovely description of it being a, a tree representation of the abs abstract syntactic stru structure of source code written in a programming language, which sounds like a, a whole lot of nonsense for, for really smart people. But it's basically this sort of thing. You basically have each of these nodes in the tree is something in your code, a construct, like your commands, your parameters, your if statements, your pipelines, everything and anything in your command, in your, your code is part of an AST. Punctuation isn't, because it really doesn't matter for the most part, so your semicolons, your braces, your brackets, all that stuff doesn't really come up, it's just kind of there to make our lives easier. The AST itself doesn't care. Um, so you get, if you're lucky, you can get pretty pictures like this. I, I've tried, it's really difficult <coughs> with what I've got available. So let's have a look at this, what a common component in, a, in the PowerShell AST, and in particular individual nodes in that. So they all have a type, because obviously it's, it's PowerShell, everything's an object, so you have lots of types. There are 72 in PowerShell 5.1 that all inherit from system.management.automation.language.ast. Uh, 71 in 6.x, uh, we, we lost one somewhere under the under the floorboards or something. And then we got another one back in 7 preview 4. Um, the one that went missing, I haven't really dug into why it went missing, it's just not there anymore. I could dig back in the source code since it's open source, but I just don't care, to be honest. Uh, and in 7, we've just gained ternary operators, which are a thing. Um, well, you might like them, you might not. They're there, don't use them, use them. Whatever. It's just another AST element. Everything has a parent, so obviously it's a tree, so you need to be able to go up and down the tree, so you need to know what your children are, who your parents are. I don't think I've ever seen anything with more than one parent, but I, I'm not saying it's not possible. Um, there's the extent, which is basically the actual AST element itself, like what the contents are, your, your commands, your if statement, whatever it is. Um, it's basically the text of it plus a bunch of other stuff. Metadata for the most part. Then there's a couple of common methods on these types, which is find and find all, which do what they say. They find you stuff. Um, you provide them with a, a kind of a, a search query and say, get me all of the commands in this tree and it'll find all the commands, or all the commands that are called get command, and it'll return all that. There's also safe get value, which is really useful as it returns whatever the thing, the value of it is in a safe way. So if you're taking user input, you can use this to get it without invoking any parsing or running the code in case people try to do injection attacks and stuff like that on you. Really interesting and useful way yeah, user input for the most part. Um, so now we've got this, how do we actually have a look at this AST? Because it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's abstract in name and concepts all the time, because it's just stuff. So there's a couple of really useful modules. So P show PSAST, which I'm going to show off in a minute, is a really nice GUI for looking at what an AST looks like, what the elements are, what's where, and like drilling down through the structure. Uh, there's edit, editor AST provider, which is for VS Code, and it's basically you can use the current file as a file provider, effectively a file provider, 
and you can drill through, look through the AST as if it was a, a file system or a registry or whatever, like, like any other provider used to. And AST Helper has a bunch of methods for finding stuff in the AST, kind of abstracts away some of the abstractness. You all see it. <laughs> Which, yeah. Uh, there's this really good session from Anthony Allen. Uh, it's um, PSCon for you this year, where he went into a lot of detail about the PowerShell AST. So I'd definitely recommend watching that. He's got some really cool animations and stuff that I was tempted to borrow. And I thought, no, I'll, I'll, I'll read out with people to his session because he spent like hours and hours making these animations that they're well worth seeing just for how much time and effort he put into it. And I frankly didn't have anywhere near that, that much time or effort for what's what for the short part. So let's have a look at some AST stuff. So if we have a look at show ST with a, a nice simple string, what we get is this nice little GUI. We can see it's a script block because when you're using show ST, AST, everything starts as a script block because that's what they are. We drill down at the different little nodes, and we can see at the bottom here the different properties on each thing. Um, we can see the common ones of extent and parent, and then generally whatever type it is is this. So you can see it. It thinks it's a command expression because that's one of the the the, the lower level com uh, AST elements you can find. And then, yep, I know it's a string, so it is a string constant. It has this value. It's a type static string, and it's got parent and extent. And we can see in the extent here, it's got basically position on line in terms of which line it is and which column it is. So that's a really simple string. Um, if we have a look at something a bit more complicated, which is a running command, we see the same couple of things. It's part of a pipeline, <coughs> even though there's nothing else in that pipeline other than this. We can see it's a command. And again, we can drill down saying, OK, well, the first element is the actual command itself. It's a bare word type because most commands will be, unless you're doing something funky with it. And we can see our arguments, what we're passing to it, and then our other uh, parameters. Assignments end up very similar. You've got a, a constant expression. You've got your variable expression saying it's dollar whatever, so it must be a variable. Um, and a slight, the assignment statement is the whole thing. These are all really simple things that you, you're kind of used to seeing this side of things, which is the code, but seeing the different AST elements and how they interact and how the, the tree builds up, this tool makes it really easy um, and works perfectly <coughs> partial seven, thankfully. Uh, so if we look at something a bit more complicated, so now we've got a function and we can just see, yep, this is a whole function. And if we expand the tree out as we go, we've got the script block for the function itself. We have a parameter blocks in, inside that. They have various attributes. Um, the parameters have attributes. And we can drill down all the way and say, OK, well, there's a random commander element. And there, there's an array list rule at the end. So whenever you're doing things with the PowerShell AST, I find this tool really, really useful for like, okay, I want to, I want to pick out this exact type of element out of this huge script. Okay, well, I'll run a small subset of that through here. That's the type I want. Now I can move on to using find and find all. But if we didn't want to use this, how do we find out what different types there are in terms of AST types? So, I'm a bit lazy. So, um, Patrick. Kenzie, I want to say his name is, seemingly science, has written this really awesome tool for finding different types and classes called Class Explorer. So you can see, get me all of the types in this namespace with the names like AST. And there's a huge list of them. Um, I think overall there's 73. Let's this a bit. Or there would be if VS Code was sensible. Yeah. So there's 73, because that includes the base AST type, which they all inherit from. But I can also do, get me all, everything it inherits from AST. And there's unsurprisingly 72 of those, because AST doesn't inherit from itself, and that would be awful if it did. So how do we use this? So I've got this nice script block. Uh, let's just do that. Just doing, finding me some users. There are obviously much better things it could be doing, but 
It's a nice basic example. And I want to run the find all method to say, okay, get me all of, in this case, all of the parameters. The way find and find all work is they take what's called a predicate, which is basically a where clause. So, some sort of script block that will turn return true or false. So in this case, I'm saying for every AST you pass in, check if it's a parameter AST. If it's not, I don't care. If it is, let me know. And then it also takes a true or false to say, should I go into sub, like other script blocks within this, basically recursing down the tree. So, okay, yep, that's find me all of the parameters and I get one. So there we have one. So it returns the AST element for it, which includes what it's called, the types, the extent of it, what its parent is. So I can see, okay, well, the parent is the pram block. And the good thing is, if I do the parent, I can see it's also an AST type, so I can drill into that if I wanted to. Um, you can find out the attributes and other stuff. So what happens when we've got multiple parameters? Because there are times when I've got multiple of the same thing, and I don't want to find all of those things necessarily. I might just want to find one. Um, so I can do the same thing again of get me all of them, and I get two back. Or I can say, okay, um, just get me the first one you find, which is what find will do. So the first one it finds is username, because that's literally the first one in the tree. Um, but I might want to be more specific and say, get me all of them where there are a parameter and the text is dollar path. There's probably a better solution, but yeah. So that one will only ever return me the one called path. If it can't find anything, it returns me nothing. Simple enough. So what can we do with that? It's really cool that we can pick little bits and pieces out of the content of a text file without doing too much with it. So DST comes into a lot of places in PowerShell. The big one is Script Analyzer. Um, that a lot, almost all of the rules in Script Analyzer make use of it because it's starting analysis on the code without necessarily running the code. So what I had recently is I've got this giant DSC config, but I, I, I want to make sure that when I try to run this, all of these different modules are definitely available. And I want to run this through my pipeline so that I'm not going to screw anything up. Um, we make use of Lability, and we've got a crap ton of configs that make use of this. It's domain controller. So basically, all of our environments have a domain controller. And in Lability, you've got a config file that says, these are the resources you need. If you don't have them, you can't compile, you can't put them on the nodes, that sort of thing. So I was like, well, there are plenty of times I change this, and I don't update every single configuration because I don't necessarily have time, or I miss one because you know I'm human, I make mistakes. So I want my pipeline to fail if these aren't in all of the configurations. So I wrote a bit of AST to do it. Um, I don't want to necessarily, I let the, the parser handle loading the file and turning it into different AST elements. And I say, okay, find me all of the dynamic keyword statements because I've went through show AST and said, what the hell is import DSC? It's magic and I, yeah. So it's probably a command, but how do I pick out that entire line? Because it's the line I care about. Turns out it's a dynamic keyword statement. Then for all of them, because there's probably more than that in there, as in almost all of DSC is dynamic keyword statements, get me just the ones that are called import DSC. And then ignore the ones which are the built-in version of the module. And then make myself a pretty object because I'm going to be using this elsewhere and I only care about the module name and version. So I can then run this. And I've screwed up again, as I always do with this demo. And I need to be in, I'm looking in the present one directory, but that's not where it is. Uh, examples. So now I get back my, my nice list of modules. So now I can actually use this in a more sensible way and in, in places that I need it used. But with what was probably half an hour worth of work, partly because I knew what I, some of what I was doing, um, I can now turn my basic PowerShell scripts. I'm like, oh, I could regex this and it'll be really awful. 
sometimes people put quotes around stuff and yeah. Or I can just trust the AST to know what the hell I want and say, get me these things that look like this. And it's like, yeah, that's the data you want. So it's yeah, really useful for this sort of static analysis, linting type of stuff. Any questions so far on the PowerShell AST stuff? Okay, so, Chris, yeah. Yes. Is yes. Yeah. Can you explain why? Uh, it's so it recurses through sub um, script blocks that are nested inside of it. Um, you can set that to false if you like. I, I only trust the top level script block, or it's like I just find it regardless of where in the tree it is. Just keep looking until you find it, or run out of tree to look through. Um, there are times you want to set that to false. Most of the time, I'm like I, I'm just going to set it to true and. My search is, is uh, restricted enough that I only find what I need to find. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You bring that up. Uh, I'll put an example of doing that in there. Okay, so how do we make our own AST? Because the PowerShell AST is a bit complicated, but you kind of get a feeling for, okay, I know what these things are in code as I type them, and therefore I can, you know, I can see the types that, so it, it makes some sense there. Well, we're going to need lots of classes, lots and lots of classes. Uh, when I was working this out, I figured one per type of node in your language, whatever language it is you're trying to build an AST for. Um, so I'll show you an example of one I've built, which makes use of quite a few classes. Then you're going to need tests, tons and tons of tests as well, because you've got the language going in, you know roughly what you want the object coming out the other side to look like and what extra data you want. So you need to make sure that's the case. And no one particularly wants to go through this manually. Because, you know, we don't write, we don't write PowerShell for fun. Well, some of us do, but when you're doing something like this, you don't want to manually go through all this and keep typing stuff. So yeah, ton of pests the tests. Definitely use existing ESTs as an example. So I use the PowerShell one as an example for a lot of how I was implementing stuff, things like the parent and the ex. I didn't use extents, but I used parents a lot, used the different types. The find and find all I haven't implemented yet because it's a little complicated. And I need to see Matthias' talk next to figure that stuff out. Um, depending on what you're doing, you might need a parser as well. Um, so if you're lucky and are dealing with something like I was, where I'm, I'm dealing with JSON files, so PowerShell handles those really nicely for me. They just become objects, and then I have to do stuff on those. Or if you're dealing with like YAML or some, if you're dealing with something PowerShell will turn into useful objects for you, great. If you're dealing with like just plain text files, you're going to need to write a parser to to deal. With, oh, find someone else's parser and convert it, like I did. Um, and that's just to be able to deal with all of the other stuff in your in your code file. <coughs> So once we've gone through all of the hassle of writing an AST, how the hell do we actually use it? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, it depends a lot on why we wrote and uh, built an AST. So I do a lot of stuff with ARM templates, and validating them is pretty garbage at the moment. There are, it, it mostly works, but the areas it doesn't work are really painful. So I want to write something that would make this easier. And I could have just written a bunch of regex or like something else. I'm like, no, let, let's do this in a in theory, a sensible way, what might, might turn out to be a less sensible way, but yeah. Wrote an AST, build the objects up, do stuff with it, do some analysis. So if you're using linked templates or nested templates, um, you've got commands like test Azure deployment, where you can just throw it in Azure and it goes, okay, well, this is probably a valid template. But if you're using linked uh, templates, it doesn't validate that the parameters you're passing in are the parameters it expects on the link template. Because why would it? You know, you're just telling it that template over there probably exists, and it'll validate that the template exists there, and is, and is a valid template on its own, but it won't test the link between the two, which is a bit painful when you're like, okay, well, I'm just about to deploy stuff. Oh, wait, my test. It's gone through all my way through my CI pipeline, going to deploy the test, and you're like, well, it's broken. Uh, I've got to run another PR to fix this a type or this parameter or whatever, yeah. Uh, but yeah, any sort of static stat analysis, linting uses ASTs because 
you get the co the structure of the code without having to parse it and do other things with it necessarily. So script analyzer is a good example of that. There's a whole bunch of tools out there that do this sort of stuff. Most languages have some degree of static analysis. When you're dealing with languages that don't, like ARM, which is technically a language, uh, you kind of have to fudge it. Most 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 people write power sh uh, like pass the tests or just similar things. Uh, I built this with the idea of that you'd use it with pass the tests on top of that. So a quick run through of ARM templates in case people aren't aware of them. They're a declarative syntax for writing Azure, uh, deploying Azure infrastructure. <coughs> it's sort of JSON in that. It, which is a really weird thing because it's it's a JSON file. It's definitely called .json. It looks like JSON, but you can put comments in line, which JSON doesn't allow. Arm's like, yeah, whatever, just do it. I don't care. And it, you know, it, uh, that's fine. Just don't run it through a JSON parser, basically. Um, the schema is well documented. It doesn't change very often. There's a bunch of docs online for this. It's actually really well documented for for a Microsoft product. Uh, well, for an Azure-based product, at least, shall we say. There's five diff five core components of an ARM template that all of the templates can use, no matter which, how, how many as deep you go. So we've got resources, which are the things you actually deploy, so your VMs, your storage accounts, your app services, all that stuff. You have to have at least one of these for it to be a valid ARM template. You've got your parameters, which is the stuff you pass in, same as PowerShell, things I want to change per deployment, potentially. You've got variables, which are, as you'd imagine, stuff inside the templates that might change based on user inputs, but is a, a mostly fixed set of things that you know. So what you want machines to be called might be a, 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 a string with some user input added in. Outputs is stuff that gets chucked out, unsurprisingly. So this can be things like what gen randomly generated URLs you, you're building in your ARM templates, chucking those out for late use in your pipeline. And then you've got functions which are kind of like the, the built-in ARM functions, but you can kind of do your own stuff in there, sort of. There's a few limitations. They're kind of useful if you're doing like, uh, if you want to standardize naming of all your resources, so you can use a function to say, build me it based on these few inputs that the user's told me. And then in my actual resource, I'll tag on a shortened version of its name, that sort of thing. So it keeps your stuff standardized within some some parameters that you know. So let's have a look at this, this tool I've built. It's, I, I think it's like 0 0.01 version at the moment, um, but it's it's there. So I've got a nice uh, Git repo here. Let's hide that for now. Um, got all the usual stuff you'd expect. I've got some dependencies. In theory, I've got some documentation. Uh, it's uh, there's, there's files there. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's auto, <laughs> automatically generated fo files there. Yeah. After watching James's talk this morning, I'm like, I should <laughs> should probably fill some of those documents in. Yeah. Got a bunch of stuff for my pipeline, and because this is on GitHub, I've got some stuff for how you should contribute to my code. Um, if people want to contribute, that would save me a bunch of time. With my source, I've got classes. Obviously, I'm using lots of classes. I've got a bunch of private functions and, and like one public function at the moment. So in here, I have a bunch of different types. Uh, should I zoom in on this? Can everyone see this fine? Or would zoom in a bit more? So I took a similar approach to what PowerShell and other ASTs have done. I've got a root AST element, which has a name, a parent, and then a common method I'm using everywhere. Uh, there'll be a couple more going here as I write them, but this is for, as it says, resolving values. And then every element, everything under that inherits from that type. So I can always just pass stuff around, pretend it's that, and it'll mostly work when PowerShell doesn't want to play more at least. So again, I've got all the different types of things that my resources have to have. In this case, my template has to have these things. The schema is probably going to be that unless someone specifies something else. I don't do any schema validation at the moment uh, because I can do that in 6 and 7. I can't do that in 5.1 easily, at least. Uh, there's some external modules out there I could make use of for that. <coughs> I just haven't looked at that yet. And then B 
because I'm doing this for validation, I want to know if there are any errors, so my users, so people using this can figure out if there are, and if the template's even valid. Um, got a bunch of constructors that take different types of input, so I might be able to pass it a path to a JSON file, I might pass it a path with some parameters, so if I'm passing things in, if I've already converted that JSON file to a, a custom object, I'll take that, or passing in a custom object and a parent, so I can handle nested templates, potentially as far down as I need to go, assuming they're, they're written reasonably well. I do some validation, do you have a schema, do you have a content version, do you have resources? Because without those, it's not a valid ARM template. And if it isn't a valid ARM template, I just stop as soon as possible. And then I just go through setting all the different properties. Pretty straightforward. Um, do some stuff to make sure I po populate all the resources. And as I'm going through each of these types of things, I'm generating a new object of that AST type based on the input. Um, and some stuff about setting the different types of parameters, variables. So, that's a lot. So, in my resources, if I've been passed in a nested deployment, I have to now make a template for that. So, I, I, I don't want to lose anything that the user's passed in. So, if they pass me more JSON now on a well, I want to keep a copy of that and build a new object of the type I expect, just in case they ever want to look at it. But yeah, same sort of ideas as all the other steps. It's kind of like you would expect when you're writing this, any sort of weird nested recursion type thing is just build things up as you go. What, pro what properties as a user would I want to validate? What things do I need to test? Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff. So once I had all of these core AST elements sorted out, you kind of have to deal with the rest of the code. So if I show it arm templates, for anyone who hasn't seen them, they're so it's yeah, it looks mostly like JSON. There's some weird square brackets type stuff in here, which is where it's calling functions built into the ARM language, but it's just JSON for the most part. The problem becomes, for me, if I'm trying to validate this, what the hell does this turn into in production or in, in my pipeline? I, I, I can't know because what, what's the user specified? So I, I had to find some way to pass that, and I was going to go to my good old faithful regex, um, but again, I'm like, well, how, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with there's like multiple of these nested within a function? How do I do all that stuff? Um, and then some lovely people decided it'd be really good if they'd write an extension for VS Code that gives me all the syntax highlighting. It's like, well, they must have done something with that. Went and looked at the extension and they've written a parser. And I'm like, well, it's in TypeScript. This is in PowerShell. How, how hard can it be to convert these? Uh, apparently weeks of my life. <laughs> <laughs> But it gave me a starting point. So like, yeah, TypeScript dealing with it is just plain old fashioned text, which means they have to worry about things like braces and if things are a quoted string or not a quoted string, whereas PowerShell is just like, it's a string. If it's got quotes inside of it, good for you. If it doesn't, it's a string, who cares? Um, which made it interesting converting some of their code, but at the same time, it wasn't too difficult. There's bits and pieces in the, in the, in the code left over from them that I need to tear out. But I, I basically I built up every type of class they had in TypeScript, I built a PowerShell class for. Some of it was less necessary than others, but I was like, I just want to make it easy for the initial transition, just build everything out. Um, they had a whole bunch of tests, which made it was easier for me to, to prove this worked or, or didn't work, as happened to be the case a lot of the time. Um, and going into this, I knew basically zero about parsers. Uh, I know slightly more about parsers now, but it's still a, a weird and arcane art that I just don't quite get, even after debugging through this in all sorts of interesting ways. But it, it, it does kind of what you'd expect. You read a string in, chunk, chop it up into chunks of different types of tokens. So, okay, well, that's a, that's a word, so that's a token. That's a bracket, so that's a token. And then work with those objects later on. 
kind of makes sense as you start going through it, but also you're like, okay, well, that's a that, and that's got this type, and yeah. You kind of get there eventually. The end goal being, I can then take, I pass this any sort of string that ARM would expect, and it'll go, okay, well, what you've now got is, uh, if we take the example from my test, so if we take this uh, concat here, it'll go, okay, well, what you've now got is a, an, ob a, an object containing a function and a string, and then another function with a string inside of it, so a bunch of nested objects. Um, so I just wrote some code that went, okay, well, if I've given you, I, I give you the, the final object, if I've given you something with a, that is a function type or function call, then check all of its parameters. And if you can resolve them, call this other function I've got. So I sort of wrote, uh, well, there are a lot of functions in ARM. So like, a lot. They all do various different things. So I wrote some PowerShell to go, okay, for every type of function you can make an ARM, hit scaffold out the basic function. So they all, the vast majority of them at the moment do nothing because I've never had to use some of these, so I've never had to write the, the code for them. Uh, others are things that I can, I, I won't know at deployment time or at validation time. Like this is resource group, which basically returns an object with a bunch of metadata about the resource group you're deploying to. But I've got no idea what the subscription ID is or what the resource group name is going to be. I also don't really care because you're just doing validation. You're just saying, if I deploy this, will it probably work? Are all my parameters right? That sort of thing. Have I screwed something up? You see, for the most part, you probably don't care about those things because you're not testing as real as you are. That's what your test is e deployments for. And I, I just put a bunch of random text in other places, kind of like, again, most of the examples I see and, and use myself, I care about the ID of the resource group and its location and maybe its name. So as long as they're, they're there and the rest of the stuff's there just in case, we're probably good. Um, some of the others get a bit more complicated, um, references being a particular pain in the neck to deal with at the moment. But, I, you know, it's a work in progress. So on top of that, I, well, with that, I now have a, a function I can pass a template to, pass it whatever parameters I expect, and get an object at the end. So if I do this, here's one I prepared earlier. So I pass it this, that, that example template, and it's returned me this object. It says it's valid, I've got no errors, it's got this resource in it, and I'm passing it a parameter. So if I do resources, I can see the resource I've passed in, what its name is, what its parent is, what the properties of it are, that sort of thing. And this is all good and well, and I can run a bunch of pester on this and say, is it a valid template? And hopefully all the errors at the bottom will bubble all the way up. But what I can also do is fancy things with graphs, because everyone likes visualizations. And uh, Kevin Marquette was kind enough to write PS Graph which lets me graph things really easily with stuff. The graphing is a little dodgy at the moment because I haven't figured out how to do this properly. Um, so yeah, I'm sure everyone can read that really well, but I now see at a quick glance, okay, I've got this primary template, which is obviously my top level one. It has a virtual machine and a, a sub deployment. I've just picked random shapes for the different types of things. I should probably figure that out at some point or put some better labeling in, but this was like for this demo. But now I can see this, this deployment here is for this template, which has all of these parameters. And it deploys this thing at the end here. And I, I can use both the benefits of validating all of this template with also graphing it out a bit and making it look pretty for like management and stuff who, who care about pretty things. So, uh, any questions on the ARM template DST stuff. Good. So, what did I learn from this? Because, you know, it's taken me some time to, to write all this and test it, and uh, I'm still maybe halfway through, maybe further. Bloody difficult. Like, I, 
when I went into this, I was like, oh, well, it's just a bunch of classes, and I just have to like inherit from each other, throw an object at them, and pass the object. Easy, right? Can't be that difficult if PowerShell does it. And then I remembered the people who've worked on PowerShell, and the people who work on PowerShell, I'm like, yeah, actually, it's pretty difficult. If you're really lucky, you're passing a file that PowerShell will deal with. So I'm good, I've got a JSON file, great. If I'm dealing with like an any file, or a text, some other plain text file, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to write something to pass this. Any files, not so much, a couple of people have written modules for that, but you're still dealing with the problem of, I have to pass this text into an object format I can then use and deal with in a better way. Drawing out how the AST should look before writing any code was really good. So I, I did this, I opened one note up, grabbed the pen, and went, okay, well, I've got a template, it's got these elements, this thing can look like this, these are the things that this can do, just reading the docs and going, okay, this is how it can look, how the hell do I model that? as a class, or as an object of some sort in PowerShell, or whatever language I decide to write this in. Tests helped a lot. Um, I've broken various things in, in the process of writing this, as I've went on and went, oh, I need to add this functionality to, to fix this. this. What I considered an edge case originally was actually, I yeah, know I've got a bunch of templates that do that crap. How, how do I handle that? How do I handle this? Uh, I broke a bunch of stuff. Test well helped me point out all of the things I broke. And I was like, okay, well, uh, how do I deal with that and maintain that and do with that? <coughs> and doing the parser helped a lot with all these tests because someone else had a bunch of sensible things, mostly uh, some weird TypeScript things where they have like null and undefined as separate things. I'm like, well, PowerShell just calls it null, so I'll throw away half your tests. Yeah, so rewriting the VS Code extension parser helped. Um, I didn't have to learn 100% what a parser is. I just had to kind of fudge my way through it and get kind of get a, a feel for what it looks like, what it should be doing, that sort of thing. It really is bloody difficult. So many, like a lot of things are edge cases or you think are edge cases and then you're like, actually, no, that's probably quite common. Well, what happens if someone does that? How do I deal with it in a clean way for them to be able to move on from it? Throwing red text is one thing, but I'm like, well, that's just gonna fail their pipeline even if it's not necessarily an actual edge case, or like an actual problem. Yeah. I still haven't fixed all of those edge cases. Some of them are quite wide edge cases. Yeah. So what do we do next? We've got this lovely AST that like, models the, the language we're working with. No idea. Yeah. Like, I, 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 in, in my case, I have to add a bunch of docs, a bunch of examples, even more tests, and build some tools on top of it. So. Yeah, I built this for ARM validation. I need to write a crap ton of pass the tests that make use of it as examples for other people who want to use this. Because ideally, other people will make use of this other than just me. Because as much as I've enjoyed and learned a lot from it, it would probably be useful for the community as a whole to kind of make use of it. Um, well, and presumably, if you're writing an AST, you have some sort of end goal for using it or you just like to learn things and torture yourself with really difficult problems. Um, apparently I do. Any questions? Anyone still alive? <laughs> yes. So you enjoyed writing this AST for you. Yes, yep, for the um, most part, yeah. Will you be hooking that into some kind of DSC kind of validator? Because one of the things that I've often struggled with, well, what takes a lot of time is the linking of the deployments of AST, sorry, uh, ARM templates yep. to the associated DSCs and actually do the operating system stuff. Uh, I haven't considered that because I was mostly focusing on the ARM template side of things because if your DSC fails, that entire deployment fails at that point. And I can't easily validate if that's going to succeed or not. Yeah, and it's, prob it's probably a completely separate module to, to deal with that. But if, yeah, as you were mentioning, the, the nested script to yes. the other one, being able to associate the nested script against the DSC parameters of the config, that would be... That would be lovely. Yeah, um, that would be lovely. But that would mean I'd have to crack open a zip file and interrogate the PowerShell inside there. I could do it, um, but I suspect there would be a lot of other edge cases like general custom script extensions and what happens about... Because as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what type of extension things are or what type of resource things are. I'm just like, you've given me a bunch of properties. They're probably right. I'll chuck them into the properties of that extension. Mostly care about the, the link templates and that sort of thing. Um, I could probably do something with that, but it would mean talking to the 
APIs are going. Is, is this right? Is this not right? Do you expect these things? Um, that's a it, it, file an issue, and I'll probably deal with it eventually. No, of God, no, no, definitely not. It, it's on GitHub at the moment. It's not published to the gallery yet because there's like a whole bunch of features that aren't even there or working. As you saw, I've got like hundred something uh, functions I have to write, and uh, I'm not going to write them all for like the first version. I'm going to write the really common ones and then fix the rest as I go and people ask for them or people write them. Yeah, because it's open source. Please help me. <laughs> Someone help me. <laughs> um, so yeah, my slides are on GitHub. That, as I say, that project's on GitHub. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Slack and Discord. If you're not on Slack or Discord, please join. We need more people because it's a wonderful community. If you've got no more questions, then thank you. Yeah. It's over a little quicker than I expected. Just reading what I should have said was when I was showing off the find and find all stuff, if you want to learn more about how that works, Matthias' session next is going to go into AST visitors, which is all about that stuff. Yes. <laughs> You can go and grab, grab some coffee early.